Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so as you heard, I have a pre-recorded talk. Um, so please go ahead and, and listen to that. That's, that's much more comprehensive than the summary I'm going to give now. Um, so I'm Ravit Heled and I'm uh, from the University of Zurich, as Daniel said. Um, and really maybe the most important uh, point I want to make here is that there is a clear link between the formation of planets, their evolution and their internal structure. Uh, and basically, um, you know, we cannot um, study each of these uh, aspects separately because they are really interconnected. And therefore, if we really want to understand how we can use the internal structure to understand the, plan the, the formation of the planet, um, we really need to understand how it evolved in time um, uh, and so on. And this is why I really uh, want to emphasize the fact that they are um, really linked. And the idea is that we have to, to, to investigate them together and try to see how we can um, take each of these aspects to get a better understanding of, of giant planets in general. Um, okay, but when it comes to giant planet formation, the standard model uh, is known as core accretion. Uh, and in this model, basically the idea is that uh, giant planets form or begin to form in a similar way to terrestrial planets, and this is basically by uh, accumulation or accretion of solid material. Um, so here I show you a sketch of, of the core accretion model, um, and, and before I go to the um, different um, stages, let me just tell you what you see here. So here we have the mass, which is typically given in Earth's masses as a function of time, which is typically a million of years. And the reason that you don't have numbers here, it's because uh, it really, it, it's really model dependent. Uh, but we are talking about a few million years uh, when it comes to the formation time scale, uh, and of course, if you think about the formation of giant planets, you want to reach a mass of, let's say, a Jupiter, uh, just to give you a feeling for, for, the, for the scales. Okay, and what we see here is we also see uh, clearly three different phases. Uh, but first, let me tell you what the curves uh, correspond to. So we have um, the, the red one, this is the heavy element. So, so, so these are basically um, the, solid, uh, the solids that are accreted. Here we have the hydrogen helium, uh, mass, or if you wish, the the mass of the gas, and then we have in the light view we have the we have the total, uh, so the total planetary mass, which is basically uh, the hydrogen helium mass plus the heavy element mass. Okay, so this is what you see here, and basically what you can see is that there are clearly three different phases. So the first phase is really dominated by accretion of heavy elements of or of solid material, if you wish, and. This is really the phase that leads to the formation of terrestrial planets if the formation stops there. So again, the idea is that if you think about giant planets, you first form a heavy element core. This can be via planetesimal or pebble accretion. And then you really have a, an object that is um, dominated in composition uh, in heavy elements. And then we have a second phase, which we often call phase two. And this is where the heavy element mass is not increasing very much, but there is a steady accretion of hydrogen helium gas from the disk. And this is what we call phase two. Typically, uh, it can be a pretty long uh, one, but again, this really depends on the model. Um, and this is the stage where the core is massive enough to accrete gas from the disk and, and retain an atmosphere. So if you stop to forming a planet at that stage, you would have an object like a Neptune or mini Neptunes. And then if you manage to grow fast enough, you can reach phase three. And this is basically when the gas accretion rate is, uh, is higher than the heavy element uh, accretion rate. And then we reach what we call runaway gas accretion um, or runaway growth. And basically we have the formation of a giant planet. So uh, the nice thing about this model is that it's very naturally uh, basically explains the diversity of planets that we see and you know this uh, three different uh, um, type of planets so terrestrial planets you know gaseous rich planets but but uh, intermediate ones and then the gas giants so this is basically the idea of this model uh, and recently uh, there was a, there was a paper uh, that looked actually at um, uh, it's meteorite uh, data, and they suggested that uh, Jupiter growth had to take a uh, pretty, pretty long time. In particular, they suggested that there was a time of about 2 million years uh, when Jupiter had a mass of uh, between 20 and 50 
uh, times the mass of the Earth. And this is not very easy in the standard uh, formation models uh, for Jupiter because typically uh, when you reach um, a planetary mass that is around a few tens of Earth's masses, uh, typically the planets wants to go into runaway gas equation. Um, and in these uh, two papers that are listed here, basically the idea was uh, that maybe you really form the core of giant planets by, by pebble accretion, but then you have a stage where you have efficient accretion of planetesimals that because of this accretion, uh, they provide enough energy that basically delays the, uh, the phase of runaway gas accretion. And that would allow Jupiter to be massive enough for a long enough time uh, to, to, to maintain a relatively uh, small mass before it reaches uh, runaway gas accretion uh, for a, a time scale of about 2 million years. And then basically after it managed to cool down enough, it would go into phase three, which is runaway gas accretion and would be formed. And I, I just tell you that this is a bit technical, but it is very interesting because it's first time when basically we can use this type of uh, um, data to constrain Jupiter formation time scale. But as I said, uh, we really have to link these three aspects of formation, uh, evolution, and internal structure. And here I just um, uh, mentioned uh, models uh, from the Valetal uh, paper. Uh, these are Jupiter models based on, based on Juno data uh, at the time. Um, so of course, there is a non-uniqueness issue when it comes to planetary modeling. But with Juno gravity measurements, uh, which were very, very accurate compared to what we had before, it became clear that Jupiter is inhomogeneous in terms of composition and that it probably does not have a compact core, uh, but has something which we call fuzzy or dilute core. So the question is, how can we link now giant planet uh, internal structure with planetary uh, origin? Um, and in order to do that, basically what we need to do is we should determine the primordial internal structure uh, and also then model the planetary evolution. So first of all, when it comes to planet formation, first we need to ask, well, we know that we have this uh, accretion of heavy elements, but where do they go? So if we ask this question, we can come up with a prediction for the distribution of the heavy elements as the planet uh, grows. And in this uh, example of a paper, basically we looked at where the heavy elements are deposited. So in, in old models, it was assumed that the heavy elements that are accreted, they all go to the center of the planet. But it was just an assumption that was made to make the calculation easier. Uh, but in fact, once the, the planet has a, uh, has a mass of a few Earth masses, um, it can uh, have a hydrogen helium envelope. And then when you accrete more solids, actually they evaporate in this, in this atmosphere. So they don't necessarily go to the center of the planet. And of course, as the planet grows in mass, it can retain a more massive atmosphere. And then the heavy elements are actually deposited further and further from the center of the planet. And this is what you see here. This is the fraction of the heavy elements in the envelope as a function of normalized radius of the planet. This is during the formation of the planet. Uh, and here you see um, different times. These are in million years. Uh, and the point from, from, from this plot is just to see that at early times, really the material is closer to the center, but still not exactly at the core. But as time progresses, uh, really the heavy elements uh, are deposited uh, uh, further from the core. And that tells us already that formation models actually predict that, um, you know, uh, giant planets do not have this uh, structure of, of uh, distinct core and an envelope, but actually you have some kind of a distribution of the heavy elements. And the other thing is that we find that the core mass is actually almost very small, max a few times the mass of, uh, of the Earth, but not 10 or 20 Earth masses as, as was previously thought. And here you can just see the difference between uh, solids of 10 meters versus 100 kilometers. So of course it depends on the details, but this tendency seems to be robust. Um, so as I said, basically, we, we concluded that cores of giant planets uh, are expected to be fuzzy, and that means that the core is not distinct from the envelope. It also means that the core uh, can include hydrogen and helium, um, and that the structure of the planet really has some kind of composition gradient in the deep interior. And here you can see um, the heavy element mass fraction as a function of mass uh, uh, versus time for two different formation models for Jupiter. And the only 
difference between these two curves is the solid surface density that we assumed in this model. And basically you can see that the distribution of the heavy elements within the planet really depends on the local conditions. And the nice thing about that um, is that it can explain the diversity of, uh, of exoplanets that we see. And another interesting thing is that we said that actually maybe there is a way to connect the way the heavy elements are distributed to the accretion history. And we came up with this very simple equation basically that tells you that uh, the heavy element um, uh, fraction at, at a given mass basically reflects the ratios between the accretion of the uh, heavy elements and the total um, accretion. So as I said, uh, it makes life more complex if you think about uh, giant planet formation models, but the nice thing is that uh, it tells us that when we slightly change the accretion rates, and this is uh, very, uh, very likely given the diversity that we see in protoplanetary disks, for example, it's very uh, natural to, to, to expand this diversity in exoplanets that, that we see. And then uh, recently, we basically checked uh, how valid this, this equation is, and you can see it in this paper by uh, Claudio Valletta. And, and we just compared the actual calculation with this approximation, and we find that actually uh, the agreement is rather, uh, rather good. And the conclusion from that is that the heavy element profile within the planetary deep interior really reflects the accretion history. So if we ever manage to probe the deep interior of, of, of uh, planets or giant planets, uh, it can tell us something about the formation history. But here we have to be careful because this is assuming that there was no substantial mixing during the planetary evolution. Okay, I'll skip that. Um, here I, I show you the heavy element mass fraction versus mass for these different phases, like I told you before. And this is also an accounting uh, for the fact that maybe Jupiter core, Jupiter's core was uh, formed by pebble equation followed by planetesimal uh, equation. And you can see really that uh, the transition to runaway gas equation occurs uh, at much later uh, stage and at, at a higher mass. And this is consistent with these structure models of Jupiter that have very extended uh, fuzzy core. Okay, um, another uh, important aspect of that is that if you have these compositional gradients, primordial composition gradients due to this equation of heavy elements, it tells you that um, uh, the planet is not fully convective, which was also something that was assumed for, for many years. Uh, so now we know that this is not the case, but actually there is another source uh, for um, having non-adiabatic or not fully mixed um, giant planets when they are young. And this is just because of the entropy contrast of the equated gas and the equating uh, protoplanet. And this is something we, uh, we found in this paper. You can have a look by, uh, led by Andrew Cumming. Uh, and basically we, we could uh, show that the, the giant planets really start with um, entropy gradient, which for us means that it's not fully, uh, fully adiabatic and fully mixed. But of course, as time progresses, it would want to be more and more homogeneously mixed. But what happens to the heavy elements within this planet? And here you can see again, the heavy element mass fraction is a function of, of mass. Uh, and this is as time progresses. And you can see the blue one is the primordial heavy element distribution. And then you see how it moves with time. And basically um, what we find is that the deep interior of the planet with this composition gradients actually remains with this composition gradients, but, but while the outer part uh, actually mixes. So basically you can erode the composition gradient when, where it's not very steep. And then you can have the outer part of the planet um, homogeneously mixed, but again, not the deep interior. And again, this is uh, somewhat consistent with, uh, with uh, structure models that are based on Juno data. So from this study, we concluded that the heavy element gradient in the deep interior persists until today in Jupiter, uh, and there is some mixing in the outer part. And that also tells us that there is some heavy element enrichment uh, in the atmosphere uh, due to this uh, process of convective mixing. Um, so the, really the nice thing about it is that we have a new link between planetary structure and origin and uh, by basically modeling the, the evolution. Um, but just to make, uh, make a point here, while I, I showed you hopefully a convincing case that, that we now have a better understanding of these uh, three aspects, uh, 
there is a lot of work to, to do more because many models that um, uh, look at the formation of, of Jupiter suggest that Jupiter was quite hot right after its formation, that actually mixing might be too efficient, so more efficient than the one I showed you before. So in, uh, in this paper, basically, we showed that uh, in many cases, uh, if you have primordial composition gradients, uh, they are mixed. So this is something we are still working on and we need to understand how we can sustain these primordial composition gradients. And I think the conclusion is that we need more sophisticated formation and evolution models. So to summarize, uh, the mechanism for giant plant formation is still being investigated. So this you can hear in my talk. I also mentioned the, the disk instability model, which is still valid. Core accretion seems to be the standard process though, especially when it comes to our solar system. But the exact conditions and physical processes, they really do matter and they can really affect the formation process and the predicted uh, primordial structure and therefore also the evolution of the, of the planet and its final uh, internal structure. Giant planets are complex. They are really not just homogeneous balls of hydrogen and helium with some heavy elements. They really have complex structures. They are expected to have inhomogeneous uh, structures, not be fully convective and probably have these fuzzy cores. And um, the composition and internal structure are clearly linked to the formation and evolution history. And therefore we really need to combine uh, these three aspects. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ravid. Uh, good work on the timing too. Uh, so we're going to go to um, our next talk, but we'll we'll get to answer the questions when we get to the discussion section. I believe that's the plan. Uh, so that would be Andre Isidoro from Rice University, who will also be talking about the formation, uh, formation and evolution of planets. So uh, take it away, Andre. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Okay. So it's great to be here and uh, to have this opportunity to talk about planet formation in the solar system and also in other planetary systems. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Rice University and uh, I hope you have time, have time to watch my talk. So I'm going to start sharing this screen. Let's see. Um, um, oops. Can you see it? Okay. It looks good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so let's start with this classical um, plot. So here we have uh, plotted together more than 4,000 exoplanets that we have been uh, discovered in the last uh, 25, 30 years. So what we can clearly see is that um, uh, the solar system also plot in this diagram period versus mass is very different from most systems that we observe. So one of the main um, um, characteristics of this plot is the large number of planets that we see in the range that we call super Earths or mini Neptunes. So these planets, they have masses with, um, that ranges between uh, one and maybe 20, 30 uh, Earths uh, masses, but they are very, very close to their host star. So you can see here that the most hot super Earths or mini Neptune, they have orbital period shorter than the orbital period of Mercury, so the innermost planet in the solar system. So of course, you can also see in this plot that you have other kinds of planets like hot Jupiters, that's this group uh, in this upper part of the, of the plot. So you have some Jupiter-like planets right here. And of course, the ultimate goal of planet formation genius is to come up with a theory that can explain all these planetary systems that we observe. So uh, as you might have uh, listened to the previous talks in previous days and today, we are still uh, quite far from understanding as a whole how planets form. But we we made some significant progress in the last few years and you can try to connect the dots and try to understand how planets form, for example, in the solar system and how the solar system might have um, bifurcated for, for, from the formation of super Earths uh, around other stars. Um, so let's start first with hot super Earth systems in, in other planetary systems, in other, other, other stars. So here you have two iconic systems of hot super Earths. This is the Trappist-1 system and the Kepler-11 system. So the Trappist-1 systems 
orbits a low mass star and the Kepler 11 system hold, uh, orbits a, um, a sun like star. If you look at the statistics of these kind of planetary systems, so we know that super Earths, they probably orbit maybe 30 to 50% of the, of, of the sun solar type stars. So super Earth systems like this one, they typically come in multi-planet systems. They have compact, but they have no resonant orbits. And uh, we think that the innermost hot super Earths in these systems, they are probably rocky. That means they are probably Earth-like. So uh, in my talk, what I did was to try to combine uh, the basic ingredients of planet formation into computer simulations to try to understand how these different systems form. So the model is start like this. We have a disk model um, to model the gaseous protoplanetary disk around the star. We, ha we have what we call pebbles. Pebbles are millimeters and centimeters sized particles that form in, in these young disk around the stars. So pebbles drift in the disk because they feel gas dry. So like this. So as pebble crosses different regions of the disk, like condensation regions, like the snow line and silicate line, they evaporate. And eventually by this process, we believe that the pebble flux somehow triggers the formation of planet, planetesimals. We don't know in detail yet how, where and how this planet in, and when this planetesimal form. So the model basically that we use here combines, um, we test as a free parameter, the time of formation of planetesimals and also the exact location where they're formed. So we use disk evolution, pebble drift, pebble accretion, planet migration. Uh, once these planetesimals, they grow to larger mass, like larger than the mass of the earth. These, planet these planetary embryos, they start to interact with the gas and they migrate. If they are big enough, as Javi has talked to us, so they start to accrete gas. So what we did to include all these ingredients in a, in a in a computer simulation and run many simulations to see what we get. And here is the typical evolutionary path of systems that leads, that form closely in super Earths. So, so super Earths, we believe that they form far out in the disk. They grow by pebble accretion. They migrate due to the interaction with the gas disk. They eventually hit the regions very close to the host star during the gas disk phase, as you can see in, the, in this video. Uh, eventually, after a few million years, the gas disk dissipates, as you can see now. And then if you look at what kind of systems that we have close to the star, we have a multi-planet system where planets are locked in what we call mean motion resonance. So the mean motion resonance means these planets, they have very, um, a very uh, synchronous motion around the star. Another type of evolution of the super Earth systems comes in this blue uh, movie. So the planets again migrate inwards by creating pebbles and, uh, and colliding. They eventually reach the disk inner edge. They enter in a resonant configuration. And then at 5 million years, the disk dissipates. So let's zoom in close to the systems to see that also we have a large number of planets in the system, typically with more than two or three planets as for example, the Kepler-11 system and the TRAPPIST-1 systems. The main difference between the head and the blue movie is that the blue movie, you eventually become dynamically unstable. That means that the planets you cross orbits and collide and the system become eccentrically and more inclined. So we believe that systems of closing super ups comes in these two flavors. So what we call resonant, unstable systems like the head one, and systems that eventually were unstable after the gas dispersal. So the resonance state can be used to compare if this kind of simulations can really match observations. So here is what we get. So the head curve comes from the many simulations like the head curve that I showed before. So the, the blue curve comes from many simulations as the blue move that I showed before. So the head one will show stable systems where the planets migrate inwards, locking resonant chains and remain like that forever, at least uh, during the integration time of the simulations. So the blue systems uh, show systems where the planets migrate, become dynamically unstable, and they reach more, less compact and more uh, inclined, inclined and incentive orbits. 
So the, the gray curve is that what we want to reproduce. These are the observations. So we can clearly see that stable systems like the head curve, the planets are mostly locked in these specific resonant configurations. For instance, like you have more than 20% of the planets first locked in the so-called four to three mean motion resonance. That means that the innermost planet orbits they start four times and the, three, the, the, set, the older most planet orbit they start two times. Of course, you have multiple planet first in different, system, in, in different systems. So we can also see that maybe we can try to match the, the gray curve by combining a fraction of blue systems with a fraction of head systems. So we run a statistical test and we see here using the, a KS test that if you match, if you mix about uh, 5% head systems, uh, stable system with 95% blue systems, we can match the period ratio distribution of Kepler planets. Um, so we believe that um, systems like the TRAPPIST-1 and the TOI-178 are primordial resonant chains that were formed during the gas disk phase. Of course, most of the observed Kepler planets are not in this resonant state and as, we, uh, as the, the simulation suggests. So we know that uh, for a given pebble flux, so we can produce uh, super Earths as I showed before. But in fact, so the pebble flux or how much mass in pebbles or drifting pebbles you have in the disk controls the total, the final mass of planets that we get. So if the pebble flux or how much mass in pebbles or solids you have initially in the disk is low, so planetismals, they grow to lower masses. So in this case, because their masses are low, they do not migrate much. If they grow a little bit larger because the pebble floods increase just by a little bit, maybe a factor of two at most, we might have some migration because the planets can grow up to Earth mass planets. If, if you increase a little bit more, the pebble floods in the disk, so you may have some large migration as we expect for systems of closed in super Earths. If you've increased even more the pebble flux, then eventually you might make some giant planets. Um, so terrestrial planet angles and uh, uh, like moon mass to uh, Mars mass planetary angles, they probably after the gas dispersal, gas dispersal, they go to a phase of giant impacts, but they do not enter resonant configuration in, uh, during the gas disk phase because they migrate very little. Large um, super Earths, they migrate a lot and they eventually become dynamically stable in the breaking the chain scenario. And giant planets, they might have some large or some level of migration depending on their exact mass and disk uh, properties. But if you form many giant planets like Jupiter in a system, so these giant planets tend to become, become dynamically unstable and uh, planets are usually scattered from the systems and remain on various centric orbits, as we can see here in this, um, in this uh, animation, in this plot. So um, giant planets becoming dynamically unstable. They first, of course, they, um, they shape the dynamic structure of the solar system at two possible stages. They might shape the formation of the planetary systems during the gas disk phase, but also during the late stage after that, that the gas disk dispersal when they become dynamically unstable. Mm. So the question why you don't have super herbs in the solar system is very pertinent now. So we believe that, as Javi has mentioned to us, that um, we had a pebble flux in the disk. So, but the, uh, eventually Jupiter form and block pebbles beyond its orbit. So basically, Jupiter might have control of the pebble flux to the inner terrestrial planets. And that's why the terrestrial planet did not become super Earths. Uh, after Jupiter's formation, the pebble, uh, pebbles in the inner parts of the disk are very rapidly lost and planets are most likely to proceed uh, via giant impacts between planetismos and not pebble accretion. So if this Jupiter formed that early, it's very likely that, that the solar system might have looked like some transitions discs that we observe in the, uh, in the current days. So Jupiter probably prevented the mixing of different um, isotopic systems in the solar systems. 
Jupiter probably regulated the, the gold from mode of terrestrial planets and prevented them from becoming hot super Earths. And pebbles in the inner systems are rapidly lost when Jupiter forms and terrestrial planets probably forming the uh, planetesimal collision, not pebble collision. So if you wanted to model in, uh, the formation of the solar system now, uh, we have a few constraints that these models have to satisfy. So we have to produce the masses and the orbits of the, ter of the terrestrial planets. And we have to also produce the asteroid belt. We, get to, we have to get some water on Earth. So if you look at the structure of the asteroid belt, uh, the asteroid orbits are very exciting. So um, the orbit of eccentricity of asteroids is very different from the orbits of the planets. Eccentricity varies from zero to up to 30%, and orbital inclinations from zero up to um, 20 degrees. So um, the planets has orbital, uh, orbital eccentricity of only a few percent, and orbital inclinations of only a few degrees. So, and the total mass in the asteroid belt today is also very low mass, is, is also very low. It's only 10 to minus three Earth masses. So if you wanted to produce the terrestrial planets, you also have to explain why the asteroid belt is so mass depleted, but yet dynamically excited. In addition, any successful model of the solar system formation. So it has to explain why Mars is so small and why Earth is not dry. So if you look at the asteroid belt again, we also know that the inner part of the asteroid belt, the region between, let's say, 1.8 and 2.5 U, is mostly dominated by asteroids that are believed to be water poor. So the other region of the asteroid belt, beyond 2.5 U, is mostly dominated by water rich asteroids. Um, and the, these two reservoirs, they, are, they have basically overlapping orbital distributions today, but uh, they have these isotopic. Just uh, just in compositions, so this suggests that this, this reservoir did not form where they are, and probably the C-type reservoir ring was implanted in the asteroid belt later in the solar hist system history. So to summarize, so in terms of the solar system, we have today different views of solar system formation. So how we can explain this dynamical structure of the asteroid belt, how we can explain the long mass of Mars, and how we can deliver water to the Earth and how we can uh, explain the mixing of different asteroid types in the asteroid belt. So the Grand Tack model proposed that Jupiter was formed probably at 3.5 U and migrate inwards, creating a very narrow disk of material in the terrestrial regions like this. So when Jupiter migrates due to the interaction with the gas disk, it shepherds uh, uh, material inwards and creates a, a, a narrow disk. Then Saturn comes in words. They enter in a resonant configuration. And because of that Mars ratio is very special, they basically can migrate outwards. When they migrate outwards, they repopulate the asteroid belt with a mix of different types of asteroids, basically water poor and water rich. In the low mass asteroid belt model, so the solar system was formed with a low mass. We're running a little over time here. Okay. Wrap it up. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No problem. Okay. okay. I mean, you, you can finish your thought. I just, oh, if that's oh, the last really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I just have to finish this too. So, uh, so what happened was um, the slow mass has a belt born. We don't have mass in the belt, and that's why Mars is so small. So, Jupiter starts to accrete gas from the disk. Oh, let's speed up this again. So it's scattering inward planetesimals, and then Saturn does the same, and then eventually become dynamically stable in the so-called solar system dynamical instability, and the asteroid belt is dynamically excited. In the early stability model, so the asteroid belt was born high mass as the Grand Tack model, but then the giant planets become dynamically stable in a very violent way and depletes the asteroid belt and let it dynamically excited. So I stop here and I have I like to hear my open questions and uh, about solar system formation and other solar systems. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks very much. Sure. Um, Sorry. So we have <laughs> a huge pile of questions uh, wow, to go right. through, and um, I felt like uh, probably the best place to start was someone asked. Um, uh, Please, what are uh, what are pebbles? And I feel like that's a good uh, defining our terms question. So, who wants to take a swing? Pebbles are um, 
So you can imagine pebbles as being like millimeter. We call pebbles, but in fact, they are not pebbles because pebbles should be like maybe a few, a few centimeters. And most like uh, when we look, we break a meteorite and look inside, the most of, we see a lot of small particles inside. So this is small particles, we call them chondros. So, and chondros, they are typically like millimeter size particles. So you can imagine that a pebble is something that probably it was millimeter size in the disk. Yeah, for me, they are a bit in the centimeter size, but it's just very different from planetesima. These are little, little solids. So, okay, millimeters to centimeters, but it's just very different in terms of, you know, thinking about planetesima that are primordial asteroids of, of, you know, kilometers or 100 kilometers in size. Okay. Uh, so here's another question. Uh, what, what influences whether super earth systems end up in mean motion resonances or without mean motion resonances um so basically in the migration model um if they migrate they eventually end up in a resonant configuration so as soon as they are large enough or massive enough to interact with the gas disk and migrate you form a resonant chain so of course you have many processes to break this resonant configuration afterwards Okay, um, so I have uh, I have a question. I'm going to sneak in here. If if, if Jupiter is inhibiting inhibiting pebble flux into the um, inner solar system, um, what becomes of the pebbles? Do they end up in Jupiter, or do they maybe help form Saturn, or or what? Um, so as Jupiter uh, forms, the, so the pebbles beyond Jupiter's orbit, they are essentially block in what we call pebble uh, pressure bump. So if, they, if this pressure bump collects a lot of material, what the most likely outcome is that this pebble, they, they will become, this region will become so dense that you might form planetasmos. So, and uh, the, the pebbles that are inside Jupiter orbits, they have very short drift time scales. So they are probably lost in just like a few 10, a few 10,000 years, I don't know. And uh, depends on the pebble size, of course, but they are rapidly lost. In the, the, those that are inside Jupiter's orbit. Yeah. So okay. if, if you Jupiter, if you block the pebble flux very early in the solar system history, so that means that you have to form planetesimals in the terrestrial region very early, otherwise the pebbles are gone. Or you have to have some, some mechanisms to store pebbles for somehow that we don't understand yet. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel Herrera is really going after these questions, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> let's see, that one seems more like, uh, <clears throat> well, let's get one for uh, Ravit, uh, another one from me that I'm abusing my uh, chair uh, position. Um, so if the, if the size of the metal that you're accreting, be it, you know, planetesimals or just, or just pebbles, influences where it ends up in the planet, um, how, how deep it can go before it gets uh, dissolved. Um, I, I wonder about what happens if you have um, a gap formation that stops uh, that, that stops the gas or at least slows down significantly the gas accretion. Um, does that mean that we're not really accreting into the envelope very much anymore because presumably it's harder to accrete pebbles at that point? Yeah, so it's a, these are two questions. So first, for the first part, the answer is yes. It, it really matters, right? What is the size of the solids and also their composition? So they would be deposited in different uh, locations. And then, of course, this can change with convective mixing and some settling and so on. But, you know, uh, primordially, it would make a difference. So, so the prediction for the uh, primordial internal structure also depends on what you assume for the solids. And then for your second question about the gas equation, so the answer is yes. So people uh, made, I mean, different groups made calculations of what happens during runaway gas equation. Uh, and it is found that it is very hard to accrete solids in the late stages. So actually now we realize that we, we really have an issue with an explaining you know, the metallicity of Jupiter's atmosphere. And not only that, 
also the metallicity of many, uh, you know, uh, giant exoplanets, as, as you know very well, uh, mm -hmm. and that, that are observed because actually during the formation process, most of the heavy elements are accreted in the early stages. And therefore, if we find exoplanets that are uh, expected to be highly enriched with heavy elements, uh, I would say that it's either that they accreted uh, heavy elements during substantial migration, or there was a, you know, substantial collision, which, which um, you know, so that, that led to the enrichment in heavy elements. But just if you look at the actual formation process, this is something that is very hard. And this is a, a topic that was a little bit, you know, hidden under the rug. And now we realize, hey, actually, giant planet formations models have a hard time to create enriched giant planets. So the young people can work on that. This is a very good topic. <laughs> I got I got yelled at when I did my paper trying to figure out heavy element mass. Everyone was like, "We can't have that much heavy elements. Come on!" Right, it's hard. Um, oh, here's a classic one. That's fun. Uh, how rare do you think the solar system is uh, in terms of planetary architecture? <laughs> We can speculate about that. You know, if you look at um, um, like the star neighborhood, you're gonna see that um, most of stars, like maybe sun-like stars, they correspond to about 10% of the stars that we observe. And uh, if you look at the giant planet occurrence, let's assume that 10% um, of this of this observed uh, stars have giant planets. That's something that consists with some different RV and other uh, observational. Uh, surveys. Out of this 10%, we have 90% um, of these giant planets have very central orbits. So, so the solar system is, is just like in this 10% minority of this giant planet systems with uh, like low eccentricity giant planets. Then we also know that maybe 50% of the, um, of the systems of so like stars have um, um, hot super Earths. So if you believe that hot super Earths um, implies that these systems have no giant planets, so this is another category. So you can make the math, look at the, how many stars you have in the galaxy and you know, use this to est est estimate how, how many solar system like we might have. So if you do the math, you're gonna find something like one in 2000, but of course, this is a very speculative number. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another uh, interesting one. Um, basically, uh, what, is, uh, what is our current understanding for how well mixed uh, different masses, different categories of, of planets are? Gas giants versus super Earths versus um, terrestrial planets. Um, so, and I saw someone asking also about iron and, and rock separations. So, uh, so what's, what's the deal with it at formation, mixing at formation, and then of course, subsequent evolution will matter as well. So yeah, okay, I can, I can start here. Yeah, maybe Andre can uh, yeah, more, talk, talk more about the, the terrestrial planet. So I, I have to say, this is an open question, right? We, we don't really know. Um, clearly there is a different, beha be different behavior when it comes to, you know, to terrestrial planets that are more, iron, uh, you know, metal silicate rich in, com compared to, to, to giant planets. Um, there is also the issue of, of uh, you know, later processes, like for example, differentiation, which seems to occur in terrestrial planets. So this is also uh, occurring in uh, lower mass objects. Um, when it comes to giant planets, it really depends on the thermal state of the planet to, to know whether it's, it's, it's con convective or not. And then the, the, the efficiency of, of convection is something that is still being, being investigated. And so I would say that we don't really know. Uh, I think we know less for, for giant planets than for, for terrestrial planets, but maybe Andre um, can elaborate. So uh, for, for super Earths, when you compare like super Earth planets in the same systems, they typically come with the same sizes. So that's uh, they typically have this very similar masses. That's what we call P's in a pod uh, uh, result. So um, so if you uh, if you try to understand um, uh, like um, if solar of super Earths are common and uh, and the, the inside the orbits of giant planets, which you don't know yet very well. So for example, you can have the Kepler ninety system. So we have super Earths inside the orbits of two giant planets. 
So this is, of course, very different from the solar system. So in, uh, we proposed in a paper a few years ago that if you have giant planet formation uh, happening very early in, this, in, the, in the history, so, so the giant planet, if the giant planet core is the innermost super Earth to form, so it should hold all the super Earths beyond its orbit uh, where they are. So they should not migrate inwards. So, so you should expect to see an anti-correlation between systems with giant planets and systems uh, 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 with no super Earths, basically. So systems with giant planets should have no closing in super Earths. But when you look at observations today, so that seems to not be really the case. So we have some papers showing that we might have giant planet systems uh, with super Earths closing in. So that means that maybe the giant planets are not the innermost super Earths to form uh, after all. So you might have some some super Earths forming before a giant planet forming the system. Yeah. I think we realized there are two types of mixing. One is mixing of materials, which is what I answered, and Andre answered about mixing of planets within a yeah. planetary system. That's very <laughs> interesting because everybody has a completely different uh, interpretation of what mixing uh, means. That's yeah. funny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think with the with respect to the um, rock iron stuff, I mean, I think it's it's fairly well established that there's no, that there's not any reason to think that the iron comes first and then you get rock on top of it, but rather that it separates out over the evolution of the planet. It's not a it's not a primordial thing. Someone asked that earlier in the in yeah the yeah. Week. So for terrestrial planets, we know that they form hot enough, so the material is is uh you know in a liquid phase, and then there is the process of differentiation, but basically the heavier elements uh settle to to the to the center, and this is how you have a structure like we have in the Earth, where you have the metals in the center and then the silicates uh, further out. And actually, that can also happen when you when you consider other uh, other elements but then there is a complexity because of the equation of state and the interaction of materials uh, at planetary conditions and you know phase separation and things like that okay that's that's already a second order effect okay um all right so now we're on now we're on to uh, another talk so uh thanks thanks to the uh speakers